Discord. Stream. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. The Jason Cabinets Experience is brought to you by Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we provide HR to companies with 49 or fewer people with our unique HR platform, while also providing you access to a dedicated HR business partner. Our guest today is Derek Ayanelli. Derek, are you ready to be great today? Yes, I am, Jason. Derek is a servant leader with 30 years of experience in counseling, meditation, entrepreneurship, product management, and veteran transition mentoring. mentoring. He has helped hundreds of people restructure their lives to restore them to how they were meant to be, meaningful and joyful. After a successful career in IT as a trusted advisor and fractional CIO, Derek is now the owner of Samurai Hire LLC. They treat candidates like, like our masters. Serving them is the highest honor. He does what he loves by encouraging recruiters, job seekers, and hiring managers. Derek, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jace. So, Derek, we're going to start off, on a, start off on a softball question. Awesome. You're big into EDM, right? What is EDM? I, is it what I think it is? Like, it, like, I can't remember what it stands for. Electronic dance music. That's yes, right, sir. right. So, you, <laughs> so that's, that's the little thing? I thought I had no way to be honest with you. <laughs> it is a great thing. Um, and, and some people ask me this because um, they – it seems to be a strange thing about me. And it's like, really, you like music? And um, I love EDM, especially when I'm working out. It causes me to quiet my mind. Uh, most of EDM music doesn't have lyrics to it. And so uh, it's got great beats, all of that type of stuff. Uh, I actually listen to it while I'm driving, to unwind, all that type of stuff. Yes, sir. It, big fan. And a lot of EDM DJs like pretty well known. They make it pretty big money, right? Yes, sir. Cause I can think, isn't there one one DJ EDM DJ? He like he always has like these uh, like these mouse mask on yeah. or some kind of mouse thing, whatever it's called. Dead mouth eyes, yes sir. Yeah, that's him, right? <laughs> yes sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, I know. I heard they make pretty big money. The DJs actually, right? They do like the the, the different concerts and stuff. The music, you know, not many awards. And Jason, one of the things that people don't know about me is I've never been to an EDM concert. No, and, uh, you got to change that, don't you? Yeah, I do, man. That needs to be on the bucket list, buddy. <laughs> That's right. So how long have you been involved with EDM? Uh, wow. That long? Yeah. <laughs> Gray hair. <laughs> so what got, what you got you involved with? Just like the beat of the music, just like the energy? Yes. Love the energy. I wanted something. Um, to be honest, I hate exercising. And so it was something to take my mind off of it, at least with martial arts. When I was doing that, you could hit people, um, you know, running on an elliptical and staring at bars going back and forth. Uh, my yeah, mind pretty, goes pretty boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. EDM, all they know, like having a thing is called weight raise, R-E-V-E's other concerts. Or is yeah, that there's, else? That's some, that's some parts of that as well. Yes, sir. Okay. And that mainly came from Europe, right? Is that mainly a European thing? Yes, sir. Yeah, just to see that you, you do a double take, go EDM concert and go to Europe. Two for one deal. Yes, that's right. That's right. So and then uh, talk about meditation. You've been doing meditation for a while too, haven't you? Yes, I have. And what you got, what you got you started on that? Like, how do you come, you come involved in meditation? Yeah, so obviously a martial arts background brought that into my life um, from both Japanese and Chinese uh, martial arts that I've taken in the background. Um, a big part of that is meditation, quieting your thoughts, stopping the internal dialogue and working through some of that. Being a, uh, a Christian and my worldview with that, sometimes the, uh, people can perceive that to be at odds. But uh, the big book says meditate upon my word day and night. And so part of meditating is um, just not being distracted and being intentional with some of that. Um, I try to do that quite a bit. I call them clarity breaks, uh, to be honest with you. And so you're talking about cardio mind. You're talking about getting rid of a thing called the monkey mind, right? With a monkey mind yeah. takes over and destroy your mind. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah, I have a problem with that too. Yeah, I, I think most people have to get to Roman meditation. I think most people meditate like, you know, like they talk about like Buddhism and Hinduism. They think it's like you know, Far East mysticism, but yeah. meditation for everyone, I think, right? Now, do you like this, have a, do you use like a, platform like calm or or insights or something like that or you have your own, own, own meditation thing you do yeah so there i use a wider variety of things because like you i have a very active mind um i do have insight timer uh, my fiance and i uh listen to that almost every night as a matter of fact unless i'm doing an audio book or one of those types of things 
guided meditations on insight. They got music, all those other types of things. Absolutely. For me, meditation though, um, Jason is quieting my thoughts. I have a very active mind. And for me to stop thinking about things and to actually listen and be aware of my body and relax and do that type of stuff, it, it's hard for me. And so that's, that's where I work with that is being more in tune and aware of my asset. Uh, and my asset is my body and those types of things, if that makes sense. Yeah, what kills me, like my brain operates like a thousand miles an hour and like out of nowhere, some random thought will come in. Do you that's remember right. this? Like there's yeah, no, that's no one in my top hundred list. Like why does it even come up on my brain? Right. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and it won't go away until you like do some action on it. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. It's craziness. Yeah. So I just an inside timer too, but there were inside timers, like almost too much stuff on there. Right. There's too many options. Like there's even you filter it down, like only background music, only female voices, only like right. 20 minutes, right. like still like 10,000 choice. Like how do you pick? Right. So I just like, I just like, I'll, I'll, I'll pick like a number seven. I scroll, scroll up seven, whatever lands on in that screen. I, I'll pick one of those things. That's what I do too. Okay, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and I'm flipping through the screen. Yep, I do the same thing. So you say meditation has been a big help to you? It has. It has. Um, it has been immense. Um, as I mentioned, again, I have a very active mind. It's been something that I've had to work on for a long time. I take ashwanda. As a matter of fact, I did some uh, spiritual health coaching earlier this year. And learned about some of those types of things and the benefits of slowing down. My accountability partner asked me about my meditation, all of those types of things. Yes, sir. So from your point of view, what do people get wrong about meditating? Can you know a lot of people are like, oh, that's flim flam. That's, you know, touchy feely stuff, you know, I'm a man's man. That's some crap, you know, that's what, you know, sissy, <laughs> that's what little sissy men, right? Sissy girls, right? That's just a bunch of crap. What do, they, what do these people get wrong about how good about the effects of meditation from your point of view? I don't think that they've studied it. So I would say it would be an ignorance thing, Jason, um, because again, if you look at the science behind it, uh, they've done some great work out there on being aware of your body, the power of our mind to be able to do things. I mean, people who have had injuries who can um, get uh, their arms to work again and all of those types of things are being in tune with their bodies. And um, it's, it's a, uh, it's not as hard as people make it out to. I get the whole flim flam or, oh, that's gay. I don't want you to do that. And I'm using old language, of course, but um, it does take discipline though, too. It's not like I do it every day. Um, I have to schedule my clarity breaks and my meditations and those types of things. There's a difference between meditating and sleeping, which is when I'm usually listening to Insight Timer, right? <laughs> and so uh, I try to listen to some of that stuff and work through. Um, last night, I was listening to a great one on Insight Timer, as a matter of fact. It took me from my toes all the way up to my head with muscle groups and was actually having me feel the sensations of relaxing those areas, which is, again, we, we just go through life and don't think through that stuff. So yeah. great question. So what, what kind of martial arts do you do? So I previously did, and I'm currently doing, so previously did Taekwondo, Mudu Kwan, um, Aikido, Nimpo, and what was called Sayak Kali. Some people might know that as Filipino stick fight. And so Nimpo is another term for ninjutsu, uh, uh, traces back to Shogara and some of the feudal Japan type of things. Currently working through getting up to speed on parkour, which is a French martial art. It's the uh, ability to overcome obstacles and uh, running and climbing over walls and jumping through things and doing some of that. And I want to get back into say a colleague again, get some more stick fighting going on. So how long have you been doing this? Since I was 14 years old. 14. Okay. Um, yeah. So let's suppose someone, you know, wants to start doing martial arts. How would they choose the, like the, the discipline for them, right? Is there like a, some kind of test they could take or what should they do like to pick between all the various ones they can choose from? Yeah, so for me, it was more about um, what is the bigger picture? And so I call a lot of the, um, I'm not going to be very popular right here with this comment. A lot of the martial arts studios out there today are what I call McDonald's or a mixture of eclectic type of stuff. And there's not a lot of traditionalism in them. Don't get me wrong. There is some traditional stuff. I wanted to be traditional. I am fascinated with the Orient in Japan and China. So for me, getting into martial arts was, do I understand their thoughts behind why they did it? Most people don't understand that martial arts came about because weapons were outlawed. And so peasants had to learn to protect themselves from people who did have weapons. And so they learned to pick up a rake, for instance, and turn that into a staff or break it in half and have two staffs. 
and those types of things. And there was a philosophy of life. Most uh, traditional martial artists is not about showing any violence at all. It's the avoidance of violence. And again, back to the meditation stuff. So answering your question depends on what they're going in there for. Um, if you want to become a mixed martial artist, you can go down to the club anywhere down, downtown in any state, and they'll gladly teach and train you to whatever you want to do. And there is styles for some of those types of things. Me, I'm more traditional in my views of martial arts. So I would tend to focus more on the traditional types of martial arts. So you, you might not know the answer. Yeah, it does. You might not know the answer to this question, but the people like start the studios, like martial arts studios, like can anyone just start a studio? Like I'm, I'm guessing have to have some kind of certification, some kind of background, right? I mean, anyone just Sometimes. say, yeah. And, Sometimes. And, yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> kind of like, kind of like, kind of like HR, right? All I have yeah. to do is take a class and put up a website, and now I'm an HR guy. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of that going on, unfortunately. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Um. So next, I switch to veteran. You do a lot of veteran transition mentoring for people. Talk about how you got started with that and why you do that. Yeah. Um, I remember, Jason, I don't know about you. When I got out of the military, I wanted to stay in. And I'm a service disabled veteran. And I had just tried out for the Fort Bragg Taekwondo team. And my goal was to hit uh, U.S. Army and go to the Olympics. And I was going to have a shot to that. And I got injured. And so when I got out, all of a sudden, I didn't have my physical fitness anymore. And I didn't have a trade. And I remember thinking, well, at least I played with computers. Let me try that. And transitioning is a scary time for soldiers. And the reason why I got involved in it is because I remember the tumultuous and arduous time that I had on my out processing. I mean, I, I literally worked at fast food places, all of that to get to get some experience. Somebody to give me a shot, somebody to help me through that process. There wasn't I don't know when you got out, Jason, but there wasn't a lot of transistory stuff of, hey, let me help you develop a resume. Let me um, update your vocabulary so we can translate some of your military jargon into all that type of stuff. And I, I just wanted to give back. <laughs> I figured I, I was out here in the universe. Let me show you how to get through some of that, <laughs> if that makes sense. So I hate to use, use the word blame. But how much of the blame to go on like the military? How much of the blame to go on like the like the veterans? Like how much of this is the veterans not taking personal responsibility and like, hey, I'm Jason Cabinets. I know I'm getting out in six months. Let me start doing something, you know. I, I, I think this is my point. I think a lot of veterans, like, you know, they get three meals a day, things are given to them, you know, it's you know, spoon fed and they get out, it's all that's gone, right? Like how much right. it should be on them. Yeah, I think it's 50-50 to answer your question, right? I think part of the government is, hey, I've owned you for however long your contract is. Um, you don't get to spit that asset out, um, at least in the civilian sector. Companies don't do that. If you do, you get sued or those types of things, right? But in the military, I would I would think, and there's lots of opportunities now compared to when I got out, and that's still changing. We got DOD skill bridge programs, lots of those types of things to help people transition. Answering your question, I, I, I agree it's 50-50. I think it's the military to provide good transition programs, but I also think it's the soldier as well. And most of the soldiers I speak to, Jason, I don't know about you, they are six to 12 months out. And I'm amazed because I was three months out going, oh, no, what am I going to do? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think one challenge, too, is like when I got out in 2015, like the, the transition program was a, was a come to come in with program, right? But however, there's no incentive to come to commanders to make sure that people would like do a transition. Like they, like opposed to, there's nothing signal like had 10 people transitioning and none of them got a job within 90 days. So there's like no negative on their report card, right? So right. it's a commander's program, but where's it really a commander's program? You know, not really, right? So there's no incentive like the company commanders like really make sure that people take care of. Like when I, when I went through two examples and two bad examples, I was one like ACAP class and mm, E5, this E5 came in and said, hey, special, uh, we'll say special, hey, special Jones, uh, you need to come with me. You need to be on the range. And that's special, like like sergeant. I I literally get two weeks ago from now is my last day in the <laughs> army. I need to do this. I never forget. If I said, well, that might be all well and good, but while you're in the army, my job is to train you, and so you go on the range, so I can make sure you, you get trained right. And and, and there's nothing the people the ACAP could do because you know they belong to the right. commander, right? Right. And a second example, probably even worse. I was another ACAP class with, a, with the 06 and a sergeant major, and both said, you know. I wish I knew how important this program was. I would have done a better job letting my people do this stuff right. Mm. 
And it's like, but now you're leaving and you have no impact on anyone else, right? And let's talk, right. there's two, two examples, like like the, the negative part of ACAP in the military decision program, right? Well, no, one ever, like, like, and no one ever said, what is important is until they take part in themselves, right? Amen. Because they're so concerned about their stats, you know, their grades, you know, you know, all that kind of stuff, which is good. You know, I need to, right? You know, I do a good job, but yeah, it's... And, and the best best program I saw when I was enlisted at Fort Hood, I was at E4. All but time, or probably Army had a program where once you put your paperwork, ETS or retire, whatever, you put on permanent staff duty, right? Permanent duty, right? So all yeah. our staff duty is CQ <laughs> people, people who are getting now, right? Yeah. And so now, granted, the bad thing about it, like might do duty, like be off for three days in a row and have duty right. on like a Christmas day, but yep. all of them have staff duty. And, and that's just, I never realized no one, no one ever did that again, right? It's just yeah. a great program. And people like us in the army, we could focus on doing our job. Oh man, I got staff duty on Thursday and that's the kind of crap, you know? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, the, you, that was a blinding flash when you just said that, as a matter of fact. Uh, I'm going to age myself again, Jason, uh, to just compliment what you were saying. So I was 91 to 96 active duty time and then three plus years of reserve. 94 time was Bill Clinton and shutting down army bases across the United States. So all of a sudden the transitioning of people who had years of service and retirement were getting kicked out because they couldn't pass a PT test and whatever. And so those types of things, that transitioning was scary for a lot of folks going back to your original question. Why do I help? Um, I just, I love my army tribe and I love my veterans. And um, I love you, buddy, because we met in Bunker Labs and I've always reached out to you type of thing. And we take care of our own. Yes, definitely. Um, so next question, talk about what it means to you to be meaningful and joyful. One of my favorite movies is Dead Poet Society. And Robin Williams says in there that he's quoting a poet and he said, um, if we could suck the marrow out of life, meaningful to me is there's a lot of time that we waste in our relationships with people that are spent on what I call prattling and not getting to the real stuff and the deep stuff of life. I want meaningful relationships in my life. I want to be able to speak to people about what's on my heart. I want to hear what's going on in their life. I don't want to prattle with people. Um, meaningful and joyful to me is not skipping. Joyful is not skipping or doing a, a Snoopy dance, but being able to look myself in the mirror at the end of the day and go, man, I, I, I have a, an amazing life. I have amazing people in my life and being grateful for that and joyful that there's a lot of people who don't have those types of things. And for, for the grace of God, Jason, it could be me depending on my situation, right? So, so what's your advice on this? Suppose there's someone out there, right? They have a group of really good friends, but they're like, they, they're like, they grew up together. They've been the great times. They do stuff together. But right now, these people are kind of toxic, right? They're not doing anything with their life. You know, they're keeping this guy back, you know? But he's yeah. like, he feels good. Like he knows he should move on and find new friends, like get a group of people. He's moved on with his life. But something keeps tugging, like, you know what? You know, if you leave these friends, you're being disloyal. Like, how do you work through that kind of, you know, concepts? Yeah. And, and, and great question. That's part of what I've gone through in the last couple of years myself. I'm recently divorced from a 26 year marriage. I'm on two years of being single and some other things. I had to figure out what my identity was. And part of what that identity is exactly what you're talking about, the people I associated with. Um, and I've learned um, there's some people in your life that are what I call crabs in the bucket. Um, and sometimes it includes family. Um, they see somebody succeeding and they'll climb all over you and pull you back down to remind you because it intimidates them, kind of like the goodwill hunting moment. You know, it's like, look, I just want to come here one day and not see you here. You're so destined for something else. That is a rarity. <laughs> right. And some of us have to make a decision to get away from some of those people. And it's been hard for me to do that, Jason. And I'll, I'll tell you, honestly, and you probably hear me say it a lot more in our conversations here in the next time that we have of talking together. Um, a couple of books I'm focusing on this year are really helping me with exactly what you're talking about. One is called Essentialism by uh, Greg McCowan. Another one's called Effortless by Greg McCowan. And another one's called EOS Life. And to answer your question, how do you do that? you realize that being around some of those people is non-essential. It's not helping you get where you go. Yeah, you'd love to be with them, but if you really understand who you are and where you're headed, you'll, they'll, they're, they're either going to love you or hate you, but you've got to make that change and, and get out of those, some of those circles. And for me, getting out of those circles and away from folks, it's not that you're mean to them or ostracize them or cut them off. It is, I'm sorry, you don't get prime time anymore. 
Yeah, it always amazed me how, like, and of course, this is my personal experience. Like, it always amazed me, like, people closer to you, you think it was probably the best, always, like, kind of trying to bring you down. They might not mean to bring you down, but, like, they make snide comments, you know. Uh, yeah. And the people, yeah. like, you don't really know, and they're, like, like crazy, and, like, hey, you're doing a great job, you know. Always. That's right. I can never understand that disconnect, right? Yeah. That's family for you. They love you, but they also know you. But they yeah. also want to keep keep the norm too, and I get and I get that. But part of that, I mean, I've talked with my fiance about some of this. You know, when 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 you take advice from family members about starting a business, my question is, have you ever owned a business? No. Yeah. Then I'm probably not going to talk to you. <laughs> you <want it? laughs> hey, can you tell me about a successful marriage? Well, I'm on my fifth divorce. Probably not somebody I need to be talking to. <laughs> you yeah. It? And plus, a lot of it is that they still remember you from how you were younger, right? So the, how that's you were right. younger, that's in their mind. Like, you were younger, you might be, you know, you might have been undisciplined, doing that's right. bad things, you know, like kind of lazy, you know, didn't care. But now you, but that is always in their mind, right? They don't realize you've grown as a person, gotten better, you know? They, they yeah. always think of you back, as a, back as, a, as a younger person, I guess. Jason, amazing thing that's happened in my life in the last year, for instance, is all my dysfunctional family stuff has worked itself out and, and a sickness, a family member and some of those types of things. And um, it's amazing. I've got all my family in the corner now. We're not playing any of those games. We're not, you know, uh, devouring one another and trying to keep each other down type of thing. Who's competing against who? And it's just amazing. It's just amazing. So, so how did that change? Y'all just had a uh, come to Jesus meeting and, and laid it on the table. <laughs> and said, hey, this house is going to be or this or just organically got better. So I think it's a. Uh, it, it's a formula, actually, that I've learned through life, Jason, and it's time and, and truth. And what I mean by that is, is maybe when I was trying to get up my family together when I was younger and force those things to work out because it's the right thing to do was not the right thing to do at that time. But recently, I'll tell you the scenario, and um, my family is amazing. My uncle had a stroke uh, last August. And um, I was able to, because of my business, pick up my laptop and go to Boston and help my family. And I got to spend time with my aunt and my mother and my sister. And out of laziness, I'm doing a quote here, Circles, one of the, the ways I facilitated my family kind of joining together during this time was I, I didn't want to answer 17 texts differently in different times. And I just put them all in a group desk to text together. So when I was updating on the status of my uncle and those types of things, everybody got the same message. And lo and behold, in the background, what I found out was my mom and my sister were talking again. And my aunt and I were talking about family dysfunction things that were going on. And it's just, it just worked out. Suffering brings people together. We know this already in the military, right? You get a couple bullets flying, you got best buds going out that plane, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I remember hearing this somewhere um so someone asked someone else hey like how do how like how do your parents and they said well my parents like you know, in this in the 60s so they'll probably leave like 80 years old right so the question was how much time do you have left for your parents and the person answered about well, 20 years like you know they're gonna be here for 20 20 years left them well how often can they live in a different town how often do you go visit them i'll visit mm -hmm. them once a year well no really you only have 20 times left with them right it's not 20 right. years, you have 20 visits with them, right? And I That's think when right. people think about like how many visits you have with the people you care about, it's not 10, 15 years, it's like maybe six, seven times, right? And That's you right. visit your parents like 20 times, three of them you're fighting, two of them you're like, you're going through other friends, you know, three other times right. you're doing something else, right? So it's, people don't realize what limited time we have with each other here, I, I don't think so, you know? No, you brought up a great point. That was one of the things that really struck me in the last couple of years too, Jason, was, you know, if you look at the health statistics for, white uh anglo-saxon male in the united states that gets 77 or something like that i'm 51 so what's that 22 more summers 22 more christmases 22 more fourth of july's what are you going to do with them and that's assuming you're going to be in perfect health right you don't know when you hit turn 59 <laughs> you might you know slip and break a hip you know or uh, you know god forbid some you know medical condition comes and it puts you in the that's hospital right. for a year i mean you never know right that's right like people always tell me well, what do you got to do this right now well, because first of all, I'm a patientist, whatever, you know, I have no patience. I'm going to do it now. So well, I don't know. I might be, you know, right. in a hospital bed at 59, 60, right? You, you just don't know, right? That's right. So next question, you know, we're both in our 50s. Like, why is it that you have so much focus and energy, right? Most people in the 50s, getting ready to retire, you know, let me find a rocking chair. Let me go fishing or whatever. <laughs> let me spend some time, you know, doing golfing. Why do you have this focus and drive still? I, 
I do have some thoughts and views about that in depth regarding Christian worldview and some other things in that area. I think for the sake of the podcast and answering your question, um, it's been, it was a gift and it always wasn't a gift for me. Um, I've just recently started to look at having that energy, being able to process things, see things at a 30,000 foot view to think systematically about things and do all of that stuff. Um, I was selfish with it. Um, now I see it as a gift and I see it as something that I have to give back and then I have to steward. And so for me, it's not like, oh, I'm going to have the gumption for energy today. It's who I am. It's my identity. So what are you talking a little about this? What is essentialism? Hmm. Essentialism. Well, um, Greg McCowan, New York Times, two books, bestseller. I better get this right. It probably should have the definition written down. But my, um, for me, essentialism is sticking to the only things that matter. And at that's the end so of the day, that's, that's so hard for so many people. It is. And, um, but it's also different for everyone. I think that's a, a key concept that if I had to add something to the definition, essentialism is sticking to the things that matter for you. And again, not without hurting people and, you know, doing um, invasive things or being rude to people, but essentials. And so for me, one of my essentials right now is relationships. Um, my fiance growing samurai higher and making an impact in the industry and, and changing uh, recruiting, hiring and candidate experience for everyone. And uh, you're going to hear it first on here. I'm also planning on um, doing some cleanup inside of the vet programs that things are uh, have some corporate waste going on as well. And to me, essentialism in those areas, Jason, is let's get back to making this effortless and doing the right thing. And then we can all argue and have bad mouth, whine and complain about other stuff. <laughs> you follow it? Yeah. How long have you been involved with essentialism? So um, for me, I'm going to think I'm going on about uh, a year now. I actually, the book was recommended to me quite a few times with some folks and somebody who um, invested in me and loved me through going through my divorce, took me out to lunch one day when everyone else abandoned me in my circles and said, hey, man, I've been wondering about you. I love you. And he goes, a lot of the things you're saying, have you ever read Essentialism? I was like, yeah, I heard about that book. And he goes, no, Derek, you're going to love that book. You need, to, you need to get it and take advantage of it and read it. I'm studying it. I, um, I listen to podcasts. I <laughs> All of it, buddy. Does Essentialism kind of tie in with meditation? It does. Again, um, one of the concepts that uh, Greg talks about is protecting the asset. And the asset is you. At the end of the day, that energy you were asking me about earlier, the end of the day, I don't have that energy if I haven't gotten enough sleep, if I haven't um, spent time um, having clarity breaks and understanding what my body's doing and all of those types of things. So absolutely. <laughs> how do you protect your time? Like how, talk about the importance of saying no to some, sometimes. How do, you, how do you take care of your time? Uh, I'm still working on that one. And um, actually, in Greg's book, he has this chapter called The No Repertoire. And he talks about how you can say no gracefully to some things. And I'm still working through that because um, there's that inkling inside of me to want to help everybody. And I can't. <laughs> um, I can only help a few select people. And then there's filtering through who really wants help and who doesn't need help. Who's a priority on that type of health and type of things. And so kind of a flexible question there <laughs> um, yeah. when it comes to priority and times. Um, yeah, I do that's have... That's right. one time I'm being again better at too, right? You know, like you want to help people, but do, but do they want to help, right? Like what's the right. saying? Like lead horse of water, they don't drink water, right? There's so yeah. many people like come ask for help. You try to help them and you, and you do stuff and do stuff and like nothing gets better. So like, you know, when, when you decide, okay, this is a waste. I don't want to say waste my time, but when this is a waste of my time, like when I cut off and let right. them do their own thing, right? Because that's yeah. definitely a, a time waster for a lot of people. So I call that paternalism doing for people what they should be doing for themselves. Yeah. Um, one of the distinctives we have in um, uh, Samurai Hire, for instance, is I'm, you can't just toss me your resume and go here, find me a job. That's probably not gonna go well for you with Samurai Hire. Um, here's a form, here's a link, please upload your stuff there so we have it in one place. We have some initial questions we wanna ask because we're intentional about those types of things, but I'm with you, Jason. Um, I'm. That's the gauge. How do I prioritize my time? I ask myself the question, what am I responsible for and what am I responsible to? So like, for instance, I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. 
in scheduling with the podcast today. I'm responsible to you to get my bio and everything else up there, but I'm not responsible for the equipment, the scheduling, any of those other types of things. My responsibility ends on my piece on those areas. And I constantly work on that stuff, buddy. <laughs> Probably just like you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. The next question, there's something called EOS life. Is that how I'm saying that right? Yes, sir. So, um, wow. When I was in Bunker Labs, towards the end of our launch lab, as a matter of fact, I got exposed um, with my company that I was working then that you also did a podcast with me with, Outsource CIO, got exposed to a business system that was called Entrepreneurial Operating System. And it was amazing to me because one of its main tenets is simplifying things. And EOS Life is actually a fruit of that business system now going, hey, you're doing this in your business life, it can also apply to your, your work-life balance life. And so for me, EOS Life is actually the title of a book that Gino Wickman came out this past year. He's actually got a journal and a plan and some things, but it's fantastic. Um, EOS Life for me, he also points back to Greg McCowan and essentialism. He also goes through the no stuff. He also talks through some of the things that you and I have been talking about. But again, it's just been providential to me, Jason, to answer your question and that all of these great resources seem to line up at a perfect time for me. I was exposed to EOS. I remember going to my first Bunker Labs event up in Raleigh, North Carolina, and there was an EOS event um, actually in another room as a seminar. And I went there and I'm like, guys, this is going to be the next greatest thing. And now I see a lot of Bunker Labs folks are actually um, going down the road of EOS. EOS is, stands for short and sweet. Every company has an operating system, whether or not they're using it and whether or not they have a process and have simplified it and systematized it is another thing. So talk some about your last company, also CIO, like how that company got started, uh, sure. why you stopped it, and any lessons you learned that are making just this entrepreneur experience better for you. Sure. Um, I loved Outsource CIO. Um, Outsource CIO was a fractional chief information officer uh, company where I actually was part of the executive staff of companies that hired us based upon subscriptions and the services they chose to help them with their technology strategy and um, had quite a few clients. Uh, was building it while I was in Bunker Labs with you, as a matter of fact. Um, it was great. I love the technology. Um, it was acquired uh, two years ago and um, became part of another IT company. And that's what it's all about, is building something to have an exit strategy or, or have a legacy with that. I chose to take the exit strategy because I started getting burnt out, Jason, in technology. And one of the things that was happening to me was... Um, as you know, we have high integrity, um, just military background and some things, but I would recommend things to clients and for compliance. And they were paying me large amounts of money every single month and they wouldn't take my recommendations. And so I'd be like, cool, I'll continue to take your money. And that just really bothered me after a while. And they got tired of it. <laughs> so I'm a butcher this name, but I believe one of your mentors is a guy named uh, John Vicken. Yes. Can you talk about that relationship, how you got, got, got hooked up with him, how, yeah. how he helps you out? Yeah, Bjarne is a phenomenal guy. He is in the UK. I was introduced to him through a program that I took uh, last year when I, after I was recovering from my back surgery. Um, it was called Life of Love with a guy by the name of Alex Moses and Sam Shargo. And what it was was um, six to 12 lessons of some basic comp concepts about some things. And part of that program was we had a weekly meeting. We also had a group meeting. And then we had a accountability partner that we we're supposed to meet with once a week to discuss the topics we were going through at that time. Bjarne and I, uh, we just clicked. Um, he, he's an amazing guy. I met with him this week, as a matter of fact. And Bjarne and I still meet every single week. Um, and go through our accountability questions. Um, he's actually a, a Atomic Habits fan, if you've ever heard of that book. And me with my essentialism, we've created accountability uh, lists for each of us based upon those two models in our life. So he's going through habits in our discussion, and I'm going through essentials. And we meet for about an hour, 
and uh, laugh and joke, of course, because we've been good friends and some other things. But one of the unique things, Jason, about Bjarne in my life, which is very rare in some cases, is I don't have people who are willing to speak the truth in love to me. And so Bjarne, um, he's not intimidated by me. I don't know whether it's because there's maybe an ocean between us or so, but uh, he's, he's willing to go, that's stupid. Uh, why would you do that? What are you going to do to fix that? And I, I need stuff like that in my life. Talk about the points like picking the right mentor for yourself. Like, for example, like I, I literally get at least five LinkedIn messages a day or five emails a day from like coaches. Like people, I, had, I have no idea who they are. Hey, Jason, yeah. I saw your LinkedIn profile. You're doing great things. I'd love to connect with you and, you know, see if I can be your coach. Like, first of all, who yeah. the blank are you, right? <laughs> like, I have no idea who you are, right? You're like, can you build a relationship first? Like, I think so many start from entrepreneurs get all these unsolicited, you know, emails, coaching things. Like, how do you work through this, right? And pick the right mentor for you, right? Yeah. Well, I, I think sometimes um, the right mentor is found. And I mean, it's sometimes they might be right around us um, in some scenarios. Um, I'm actually going to take this back to our Bunker Labs experience. Uh, one of the books we had to read was Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi. And he wrote a second one called Who's Got Your Back? So answering your question on how to find a mentor, for me, I look for lifeline relationships. I'm looking for somebody that has four qualities, accountability, vulnerability, generosity, and candor. The reality is most people do not have all four of those. They That's may have true. two, they may have one, they may have three, but my goal in finding a good mentor is they got to have all four. <laughs> That's great <clears throat> advice. Next, talk about the importance of having empathy. Points of empathy. Um, can you unpack that a little bit? I for like me? The, the, the importance <clears throat> of having empathy. The importance of having empathy. Um, I think we have enough robots in our life. Uh, between, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a good analogy. <laughs> right? I think we have enough robots in our life between um, ring, uh, ring trees, uh, bot emails, all that type of stuff. I don't know about you, but every once in a while, COVID's probably brought this out with many of us. Just like to have a human in my life. Somebody who's listening. And for me, I think I equate empathy, Jason, with listening. And, I'm, and, and I don't mean listening to ask questions or to jump in and go, hey, I was thinking about this. I mean being present, really listening to people. And for me, empathy is listening. Can you talk a little bit about your spiritual award of you, how, how that's important to you? Wow. <clears throat> I really struggle with that, actually, over the years. Um, my favorite biblical character is Peter. Because I think I am uh, just like him. I'm on fire. I have a bunch of energy and sometimes get spun out of control. And so uh, my Christian worldview, I tell people that I came to Christianity kicking and screaming because left to my own devices, I wouldn't have chosen it. And so uh, for me, um, Christianity has changed everything for me. And I looked at a lot of religions that changed my dog tags eight times in the military uh, with all that type of stuff. Look at you laughing at me. Most people do when I tell them that. One of them was actually um, the occult. I remember having Aleister Crowley on my ticket, on my uh, dog tags at one point. But uh, how did that come about? I didn't choose it. Uh, God found me and regenerated me. And my life has been forever changed. Now, have I had problems with his people over the years? Absolutely. Um, with some of those things. And in one particular experience, um, I was excommunicated from my church going through a divorce. Um, it really shakes your faith when you lose a community of people that you've invested in for 20 plus years and they drop you like a hot potato because they think they know what's best for you. Yeah. Um, thanks, thanks for sharing that, Derek. So next, what is uh, something called a Ronin list? <laughs> okay. So let me give context. Uh, Samurai Hire came about uh, when I was just picking a name and choosing a name. I wanted to bring some levity, but I also wanted to bring some sobriety to the industry, the talent acquisition industry. And in doing so, um, I Googled all the terms, trying to find something that I was interested in. And I thought, awesome, Samurai. Samurai Hire, and it worked out perfectly. I you know, got the domain name and all that other type of stuff. A Ronin list is a concept that we're working with now. I would call it an, an army cattle call of bringing together recruiters, candidates, and hiring managers to establish a best practices and standards 
for customer and experience and satisfaction in the industry. And what I mean by that is, is there is no standard. A Ronin list, a Ronin in feudal Japan is a masterless samurai. Yes, they can happen because their clan got wiped out. And then maybe honorable reasons. And that's fantastic. If you think you found out how the industry works and way things are at, and it's working for you, fantastic. But the rest of us are sick and tired of the way that's going. And we're going to band together and have our own clan. And that clan is going to be the samurais. The Ronin list is the master list folks out there that are going to be doing things like recruiters, for instance, looking at candidates for numbers, not following up with them not responding to them in a timely fashion when they go through an interview, being hot and heavy going, hey, you're a great candidate, and then you never hear from them again. That gets you on the Ronin list, right? You're maskless. You're, <laughs> you obviously don't care about people. You're in for this, for doing things on your own methods. Candidates can be rude to hiring managers and to recruiters. Um, they can be disrespectful to their co-workers, and no one has ever said, hey, by the way, you don't treat people that way. Um, you need to be a little bit more self-aware, a little bit more other aware. Um, we actually have at our domain level when candidates are rude to us, and some of them have been, and I get it. They've had bad experiences. But don't blast me because your coffee wasn't warm at the such and such, and you haven't been able to find a job for the last six months, and I'm the only guy you've talked to. I'm trying to help you. And it, um, my poor assistant got blasted last, last week, for instance, and we put them on a um, Ronin list in our realm of they can't even get into our domain. Yeah. They will get a message that says, hey, we're sorry, you've been added to the Ronin list until you uh, pass a relational wisdom course and give us your certificate of completion, which is learning to be self-aware, other aware, and world and values aware. Um, you're gonna stay in your little place over there with hiring managers as well. Um, the Ronin list applies in that there is standards in that industry. There is certifications. You know this better than I do, right? You've got SHRM, you've got all of these agencies, but everyone's got their own eclectic version of what that looks like. And at the end of the day, many times I see hiring managers are doing the best they can with the poor budgets they have and all of those other types of things. Some others are just like, look, I don't have time. I hate reading resumes. And so I'm going to throw out a screener question. Uh, what are your salary expectations? Well, I'd like to have $60,000. That's the minimum I can do. Oh, you're outside of the range. Reject, not look at your resume. You get put on the Ronin list because you used a question to make a decision about a human being without a relationship. Yeah, I remember somebody posted this on LinkedIn a while ago. It was like a, a, a CEO of a tech coming out of San Francisco. He was talking about um, how he was interviewing people to be like a, not a, like a senior, like a senior, doing the software development, not a CTO, like whether it was supervising like other developers. I mean, on paper, that's the best person, right? They said, even this person, and they said this person, like, talk down on them, talk to them like they're a crap. They're like, I'm yep. the CEO. You're talking to me like this? Like, how are you going to talk to your people, right? Like, I don't yeah. care how good your thing is, right? And, you know, and, you know, and hire someone else, right? I thought you think common sense, you think you'd be on your best, you know, or maybe this was the best behavior, right? You know, maybe <laughs> hey, this, is, this is your best behavior. You're talking like, you're talking crap to the CEO and the other senior people at the company, right? Like, I, I don't know. Some people just, I, I don't know. This don't get on things. So Jason, it also includes companies too, right? And so yeah. let's yeah. let's talk about the hiring process, right? So if they meet with a recruiter, that's one interview. And if you put them through three to five more interviews plus text, um, you know, assessments and it's testing ridiculous. and all this, it is. I'm going to put you on the Ronin list because you obviously are wasting people's time. I could give you horror story after horror story of candidates telling me things. My favorite one that happened recently was a gentleman I was working with executive level. Um, the company wined and dined him, sent him a flight ticket to come to the location, the headquarters, introduced them to the local real estate agent, said, we're choosing you. He's back home packing up things, hasn't heard from the recruiter or the hiring manager for two weeks. He finally gets a hold of them. And the, here's what they say. Oh, I'm sorry. We, we filled that position internally. I was like, That's um, so I, That's so oh, I told that guy, I was like, look, you were in the Air Force. Um, you take it from above. I was in the Army. Let's take it from below. And let's make sure that person never hurts another individual ever again. Yeah. That's what the Ronin list is. Common courtesy and common sense. Essentialism. Effortless. All of those things. If you're not doing that type of stuff, I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down to the golden rule. 
<laughs> right, Jason? Yeah. Do unto others like you would want to do to them. And seriously, um, we were working with a company last year. They were putting our candidates through a 90-minute technical assessment on top of four other interviews. And I called the hiring manager. I said, we're done with you. I don't want to do that anymore. And you're not doing that to my candidates anymore. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just amazing the things out there, right? Um, so, you know, there's so many like companies doing staffing, recruiting, talent management, you know, yep. some good, some bad, of course. Talk about how you did your ideal of validation to make sure this is a, a, a good thing, a good company to start. How did that work out for you? How, did, how do you, what's the process of doing the idea of validation or samurai hire? How did, how did I validate samurai hire or how do I validate other companies? Now, how do you validate, how did you validate samurai hire? Yeah. So um, I'm big on credentialing. Um, I might be military, it might be something else, maybe in your industry too. I know you and I are very similar with this. Um, find out who the best practice trust agent is in your industry and take the schooling, get the certifications. I've taken technical recruiting classes. I've been certified with Barbara Bruno on LinkedIn Learning through her technical recruiting program. She's one of the top in the industry on doing some of that. Um, there's some other programs like you said, validation. Um, I just went through service disabled veteran owned business. Um, the first couple of times I did that with my previous businesses, it was a lot easier. Uh, this one was a little bit more rigorous and I'm glad to see some of those checks and balances in place. Not everybody gets those designations. And that's what I also want to see happen in the industry too, Jason, is some credentialing and some standardization so that people know what they're getting into. Hey, if you go to McDonald's, you know you're going to get a burger and it's going to taste the same whether you go here or there. Same thing. When you deal with a recruiter, you should know that this is what's going to happen. It, oh, they have that credential. That's exactly what's going to happen. Hey, I'm talking to Jason Kavnis. Here's the standard of the industry. I know what's going to happen when I talk to Jason. <laughs> you follow me? Yeah. So, Dick, so the veteran business uh, things and the disabled veteran business thing, is that really an advantage or is that a, a waste of time? Like, do you really, do people really get advantage out of that? What's so um, I used to be one of those, look, there's other people out there that probably have uh, more disabilities than I do. Um, I've had extensive work on my back and surgeries and some other things. Um, I, ended, I started to realize, again, protecting the asset, getting to your question. To be a service disabled veteran owned business, government contracting allows set aside contracts for people who have that certification. First of all, that government agencies and vendors must do business with them every single year um, through a process. And it's a benefit that we have as military veterans who've been disabled. Also, people who are not disabled can also get a veteran owned business status type of thing. But the service disabled gets a little bit more of a percentage type of scenario in that um, set aside where people have to do business with you type of thing. And so that's one benefit. Another benefit is, is I'm, I am proud of being a veteran. To me, it is a credentialing thing. To go through what I went through <laughs> for the last three months and getting that status with them, um, it's pretty prestigious. It is, uh, it's rigorous and they're training people and they don't just give them away. I had to, everything from payroll records to my taxes to examples of contracts, all of it. And again, you know what you're getting into when you see that designation type of thing. Does that answer your question? It does. It does. So, Dick, what's your success metric? What I mean, like, is your success metric success metric for you and your company? Like, you fill a certain percentage of growth within a certain number of days. You respond to candidates with a certain amount of time. Like, what's your personal success metric? Yeah, I think our niche is, is that we communicate everything with candidates. <clears throat> and so that would be our success metric. There is no candidate that walks away from their time um, with Samurai Hire and goes, I don't know anything about that job. I don't know when the interviews are happening. I don't know what the status of my um, application is. That is our success metric. Um, candidate satisfaction. I do have other ones that I do um, and, and track, but that would probably be the biggest one. And how do you vet your candidates and vet the companies you work with? Ah, yeah. Candidates are vetted through, um, you're going to laugh, and here we go out on public media. Um, I'm, I'm a simple guy. I'm an R&D guy. I rob and duplicate from other people and um, pass it off as my own stuff many times. Here's how I vet candidates. If you can follow directions, you get my time. It's amazing to me how many people do not read 
can't read a job description, cannot follow an email that says, please click on this link and submit your information and upload your resume. Why do I want to do that? Tell me how much the salary of the position is. I'm like, okay, you've already taken a lot of time. You can't follow directions. So that's candidates. Um, companies, uh, there is a rigorous process. One of the things that companies have to uh, subscribe with us is understand our core values and our core focus. And part of that is 100% transparency. Most of our direct clients that we've worked with subscribe to our core values and our core focus. And that is to present everything, salaries, company, everything. And so 100% transparency. If you're not willing to do that, then I'm probably not gonna work with you. If you drag a candidate on for weeks at a time, I'm gonna have a conversation with you. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do the right thing because stuff does happen, but um, I'm not playing games anymore with this. These are people's lives at stake. Jason is where my betting comes in. I think about the ripple effect of what that does to people, not only to candidates, but also business, HR, everyone. Does that make sense? It does. And, and what's your pricing model? Like the company pay for this? You take a percentage for a job or how does that work yeah. usually? Yeah. So we, uh, we started out taking advantage of everything that's out there for recruiters. So contingency, flat fee, split fee, all of that type of stuff. We actually our distinctive with our new clients now, direct customers is what we call a RAS or recruiting as a service. You pay $2,000 a month. We give you a job target um, assessments. You get our software, all of that type of stuff. You also can stop after the first 30 days. We'll help you find a candidate. We'll develop the job description with you and all of those other types of things, but we're not flat fee. We're not this, here's a guarantee. Um, I've had, and, in my industry, in the recruiting industry, um, poor, some poor recruiters out there who work on flat fee and guarantees of candidates, uh, you can end up working for years for a client and not get paid. <laughs> yeah. So, so <laughs> back, back to uh, the, the hiring process, right? Like, yeah. You know, a lot of people were like, they, they do like, you know, six months of interviews, blase, blase. And they'll, yep. they'll often say, well, that's what Amazon does. I'm like, are you Amazon? Like, you're not Amazon, right? I'm pretty sure you're not in the level of Amazon. Amazon can do that because they're Amazon, right? They can like, you know, have a, a empty position for six months, you know, do the long process, right? Because they can afford to do that, right? You're, you're not Amazon, right? I don't think people get that. Uh, I was smiling while you were saying that is because um, I'm not one of those people to what I do call ABC, already been chewed by somebody else. So when somebody says, that's, what, that's not what Amazon does or that's what Amazon does, okay, let me go ask them. So part of the people, some of the people who are networked are some of the top recruiters in Amazon. And I won't mention names because they've asked me not to and they knew I was going to be on here. But some of the top recruiters of Amazon I'm working with and they have streamlined hiring and interview processes. Okay, and, that's, good. that's good to know. Okay. <laughs> and Microsoft's doing the same stuff. A lot of what are called the fangs that are out there, Facebook, Amazon, you know, those companies, Google and all those other types of folks, they pivot faster. They obviously have more money to do some of that as well, but they're not going to miss out on, on good talent by having a stupid process, right? Good. Um, so next, um, we might disagree on this. So what's your take on cover letters? My take is if I see an application that says submit a cover letter, I instantly think this company stuck back in 1982. <laughs> So there was actually a poll on LinkedIn uh, today uh, from a, um, a recruiting influencer out there. And the poll was, what is your thoughts on cover letters? And the other one was, was references. And so um, I am actually, I agree with you. I wish cover letters were not needed, but we are in a different era right now. We have people who have been told their entire lives that resumes are only two pages, who have gone through COVID, had parents who have died. Where do you explain that stuff? Yeah. Do you put that in your resume? No. A candidate summary or a good cover letter is a good way to do that. And it is a tool to use right now. Again, I don't like having to add more stuff to read to a hiring manager. And you don't become a trust agent by inundating them with more paperwork type of thing. I would say, why couldn't you just, um, we actually send out to the cover letter thing. Um, we've sent out to candidates uh, an article that Indeed did earlier this year on how to document your gaps professionally in your resume. And there's some great ways to do that, but not everybody's on board with that, Jason. So I yeah. do agree with you. Um, I think it is a useless document. Um, most of the time, account managers and hiring managers don't read them. 
I was reading something earlier today that folks said recruiters don't read them. I do read them because I need a good candidate summary when I'm presenting you to my client. And so that's where I can get my blurb from many times is from that. Now I capture that in a form on the front end. What kills me when people say, well, I need a cover letter to make sure they're interested in the job. But didn't them applying for the job it's the <laughs> resume, let you know they're interested? Like, Ronin I, I, list. I don't know. Ronin list, right? Yeah. And that's, that's not making things effortless. That's complicating things. Somebody's sitting around going, hmm, that's a good idea. You and I both know that's not a good idea. Yeah. You know, and most people have a LinkedIn profile. They're stuff on social media. I just think it's too easy. Exactly. Like recruiters and people like do a quick research, you know. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Know. And, and, and so another pet peeve of mine, we hear people all the time, I'm a hiring expert. Are you really? Like you're telling me 100% <laughs> of your hires went on to be great, to the greatest hires ever. Like you're, you're the best of the best. It just yeah. drives me crazy. People say they're, they're a hiring expert, right? Oh, I'm a hiring expert. I've done this for 10 years. Well, maybe you've done it wrong for 10 years, right? Like who, who, who's validating that you're a hiring expert besides yourself? So I'm getting ready to come out with an article on this, a three-part article first was published today. And uh, I'll get to hiring managers with that question. My favorite question to ask them about that, Jason, and I'll ask you as an HR guy, what's your offer to hire ratio? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> okay. I'll know if you're an expert or not. That's a good one. You know, you, maybe you hire 10 people. But like nine of them leave after six months. That's right. For the for reason. That's right. Yeah, it's just, it's just craziness. So what, what do you think? So this is my opinion, too. I think there's always been a disconnect. No matter how good a bad economy is, right? For example, like suppose I'm working for a company and I get laid off, I got fired or whatever. I got a mortgage coming up. I need a job right now. Like right now, right now, right? So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to here. I got to find a job. Most companies, when they have an open position, they're going to take their time, right? You know? We don't want to hire the wrong person. Let's do some more interviews. We're going to make the other three people in the department you know, cover down the job. We're not in a hurry, right? So the candidate, like they're in a hurry, the companies are not right. right. Is, is this is there a way to fix this or is this the way it's going to be? I think there is a way to fix it. And again, I would go back to something simple and you and I both laugh about this. Just be transparent about that. Um, one of the things I'm looking at when I'm looking at jobs with people is how long the job's been around. To me, that's a good indicator. If you could, the job's been around for three months, I start asking some questions. Why has it been around for three months? Are you asking for a purple squirrel? Are you not paying them enough? Um, maybe this job has got too much in that job description and you're asking somebody to do three people's work type of scenario type of thing. No, you should always, from my perspective, Jason, a recruiter or an HR person should be having a great conversation about what that offer to hire ratio looks like, for instance and shortening that gap. Here's our budget. This is when we need somebody by. Okay, great. I actually have a form that we send to folks. It's called discovery questions that I send to companies that I want to answer everything about that job. How long has it been around? Why are you looking? How fast can you move? All of those types of things. And that helps with a recruiter, for instance, on, hmm, if I run into a candidate, it's like I need a job yesterday. Well, now that I know that that client's not planning on hiring for at least two months, why would I set that candidate up for that? So, Transparency on the front end. Yes. <laughs> so for, for your company, why do you focus on uh, healthcare and IT? Why those two industries versus uh, the other ones? Yeah, so uh, that's actually changed here a little bit lately. Um, I've had to learn some other <laughs> fields just with all the referrals and things that we're getting. The reason why I focus on healthcare and IT and those areas where those were my background from IT. So I'm very familiar with all that. I can look at a candidate's resume IT wise and pretty much see through the crap uh, to use some colorful language there to see through the crap in their resume. But also I can talk to them and find out if they know their stuff too. And so that's where my expertise are at. We hope to, and actually working on this right now, to have other verticals where people are specialized in healthcare, finance, military transitions, all of those types of things. I think we need many more subject matter experts in those fields because the generalists, they're doing a great job, but I don't think they're doing a, the best job that they could because they don't have all the data that's available there. Does that make sense? It does. And Derek, how do you help people with this, right? Because I'm a, I'm a big believer. If you give your resume to 25 people, you get 25 different opinions. But of course, the only opinion that matters is a hiring manager, right? Amen. So how do you, how do, and of course, that comes back to networking. How, yep. do you, how do you advise like your candidates, like, you know, do the networking to make sure that the resume is like as perfect as it can be for the hiring manager? Yeah. So I'm going to make an immediate fan probably with you. Um, I have a feeling that we'll agree on this one. I tell everybody, stop messing with that Word document. 
and I go, please work on your LinkedIn profile. Here, let me show you how you can make that as your resume and have themed resumes and everything that you need in there. It's all part of the features of functionality, especially with a premium version of LinkedIn. Veterans get it free for a year. And so you can build it out. They'll give you the keywords, all that type of stuff. Resume formatting. Um, I'm actually looking at a product right now as part of the tool that we use. And again, I would like to establish a standard. I'm getting ready in a, a second part of an article I'm writing here in a series on what should be in a job description. I think another great one would be what's the minimum things that need to be in a resume. Um, and I've seen them all over the place, probably like you have. Again, there's no standard and everybody can download one, update one, tell you what's best, all that great. <laughs> yeah, I remember there was a poll on LinkedIn a while ago and this lady, she asked, she basically a question, hey, my daughter just graduated college, she's gonna start looking for a job. She has a picture on her resume, I'm telling her to take it off, she refuses. What, what's the, the, the standard, like, what do y'all think? Like 90% of people said no picture, black and white resume, time room, trial font. I was like, right. are you kidding me right now? Like she should do the resume to best represent who she is as a person. So you should attract the, the person who's best fit for her, right? But all these that's people great. like, like yep. from 1982, I said, I used to from 1982, no Travers font, black or white, one page, two page. And, and people are saying like, well, don't be a picture because then you know, you get a dis discrimination. They're gonna look at your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> they don't know what you are, right? So yeah, this the DEI stuff is going to happen in some form. Or yeah, form. so be open about it. And, and yeah, I, I don't know. This is my opinion again. So, no, Jason, I'm with you. And here's again where I think the industry needs to be standardized, right? And, and this is why I love Greg McCowan's work on essentials. What is the essential information that you need from a resume? Everybody's got an opinion on it. No, let's establish a standard, everybody. I want recruiter input on that. I want hiring manager input on that. And I want candidate input on that. And once we all agree, standardize. Now there's no discussion on, well, I want to put my picture in here. Oh, that's part of the template. I agree. That is a great thing. I get to see who you are. Oh, a lot of folks, especially in HR circles, are like, as soon as you look at the candidate, it brings in bias. Then close your flipping eyes. Yeah. <laughs> and what, what happens when you see them in an interview? Are you that's close right. your eyes and interview? Are they going to come yeah, to right. interview with a, with a brown paper bag on their face? Right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Right. I mean, so some of these discussions are silly and they just convolute the process. Don't you agree? Uh, I, I agree. I definitely agree. It, it's craziness. Um, and we were talking about reference earlier. I, I think reference is a joke now, too, right? Because, like, what can is going to call? Hey, let me call Jason Cavanis. Um, he hates my guts for a reference, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let, I mean, let's bring that out into the open. EEOC stuff, right? And H HR stuff right now says that you cannot give a bad review of a previous employee. Mm. I don't know about your state, but in South Carolina, uh, you can just say, yes, they worked here. That's about the extent you can say. It is yeah. useless. I was working with a recruiting form. They required professional reference forms, three of them as part of their process. And the HR folks crack me up because they give these blank, black and white responses like, yes, they did work here. Yes, they were here from blah, blah, blah. Professional references, I think, are useless in a resume. What we tell people is if people want to see that stuff, have your LinkedIn profile blown out with recommendations. Mm -hmm. And I, I responded to somebody today. I was like, I have previous bosses in my recommendations. I have previous coworkers. I have um, people who have resigned under my leadership at companies where I was leading as recommendations in there. You want to see references. Look at the four-star general that left me a review. That's a pretty good reference. <laughs> you, <Yeah>. you follow it? <laughs> so. Yeah. So what do you see the future of recruiting? Uh, this is going to make me a fan of everybody too. I think that the recruiting field probably could go away because it's convoluting the process of adding another step in an overworked culture of hiring managers and candidates trying to gain access to them. And now we have another middleman in there to figure all of that out. We standardize things, Jason. We make the application process standard with everybody. Uh, nothing bothers me more than a candidate has to, they upload their resume with us, for instance, and then the company I'm working with asked me to upload it. Then they ask them the same questions. The federal forms are probably the worst ones out there. I don't know if you've ever applied for federal jobs, but I'm like, I just loaded my resume up here. Why are you asking me to put all this stuff back in here again? I think the future is you won't need a recruiter anymore because companies will be transparent this is where I'm going. I know it sounds altruistic, but if the standard is truth and transparency, 
And that's what you know you're going to get. Kind of like Continental Airlines when they went, look, we're not going to have food and we're not going to have all these hoity-toity stuff, but we're going to give you the cheapest flights out there. Everybody went, oh, that's never going to work. Mm. You tell the truth and tell people what they want to know and give them the essentials of a job on the front end. You don't need a recruiter. So what's your take on this? It's, it's like every year, there's at least 10 new tech startups who focus on AI for recruiting, improving the recruiting space, all the tech stuff. But hey, it's like, bring them up. It's like nothing gets better, right? Are these companies like start, they end, and, and, and every year it's a new recruit, tech recruiting. We're going to improve recruiting because of this right. and that, but no, it doesn't like anything changes. I, I, Jason, I will go back, and I, I don't mean to sound like a, I have a bromance with uh, Greg McCown. I actually do love to meet him someday. Uh, we have had exchanges on LinkedIn and some other things. He's liked my posts and some of that other stuff. So, sorry, Seamus, but my point here is that I don't think – that we have really looked at these things from an essential perspective and an effortless perspective. One of my favorite stories on a recent podcast of um, Greg McCowan was he was re-describing about Amazon. The reason why they became, one of the reasons why they became a giant was they made one click shopping effortless. And then they trademarked that process for 15 plus years, meaning no one else could gain access to that. And it set them apart because previously we're both the same age. Do you remember the old days of ordering stuff online? You type in your street address, the screen would swirl around. Then the next line would come in. What state are you in? And you did the drop down box and you did all that other type of stuff. One click ordering. All I had to do was click this and it grabs my credit card information, does such and such. I think that technology can change and redeem some of these broken systems. No one's willing to make it effortless or focus on the essentials. They want to, and I say this delicately, justify their job or their position. I just literally told you, I think recruiters should be out of the equation. If companies and hiring managers were doing the right thing, why do we have them? Because both of those entities haven't been held to a standard yet. Can you talk some about, you know, I don't care how good the economy, how bad the economy is, looking yep. for a job is never easier, right? You know, a lot of, no. you know, you hear the stories all the time, I look for a job for six months before I even got any of you, you know, the process. Can you talk about the mental state people need to be in to, to keep on, you know, get hearing no all again, all over and over, getting their teeth kicked in? Like, what's the, what's the advice on that? To be, you know, keep mentally strong, keeping the game, so to speak. Yeah. So we've all heard that it takes a community to raise a family. Well, I would also add it takes a community to raise an adult, too. And so... Um, if you don't have a network of people that you can share those types of things with you, because failure is part of our life. It is part of what's going on. Not everybody can be president. Not everybody can be an HR at uh, subject matter expert like Jason Cabinets. I'm sorry. I can sit there and go, I wish I could. But at the end of the day, it's just not going to happen. Getting beat down all the time with some of those things. I tell you what, what's been good for me. Um, going back to that, uh, we were talking about crabs in the bucket earlier, Jason, about who are you surrounding yourself with? If you're around people that go, I can't tell you the most liberating thing I say to candidates most of the time is you are not your title and you're not your salary range. And no one's told them that before. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't realize how subjective the process is, right? Like yeah. I'm kind of, I might be making this number up, but I think each, each job has like 250 applications, right? Yes. They, I mean, they might call 10 people for a phone interview, right? That's and right. then they, they might have like five people interview, right? And mm -hmm. until you get the interview, you get the job. A lot of people beat themselves down. Oh, I didn't get the job. Well, let's right. flip that over. You're like, like top 2% for this position, you know? And maybe right. the other person, just maybe the other person was better at the job than you. Maybe the person had more qualifications. I mean, you don't know, right? So people think beat themselves up. Another thing too, I think people don't realize, like the example I use all the time, pulls up, someone's hiring for a job, right? And they interview two people. One person comes in like Monday morning, 10 in the morning. Uh, they have you with four people, right? Those four people that had a great weekend. They're in a good mood. Now, first person, Monday 10, they're really not qualified for the job. They're kind of not really right. But they, 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 they connected on LinkedIn, all the new interview people. They know something about the background. They connected. They had a good time, laughing, fun, you know. They actually got a couple of questions wrong, right? Not the right answers. But everyone had a good feeling about that person, right? We can see this person at a company, right? At next interview is at 1 p.m. Between the first interview and the second interview, one of the, one of the people in the interview panel got in a car accident. Another person got yelled at by his boss in front of everyone. Another person on the panel found out his mother-in-law is coming to stay for a month, right? So three or the four are not in a good mood, right? 
the guy at 1 p.m., he shows up way, way called off on a paper. Like, there's no question he's got the job right. But, like, he knows nothing about the people he's interviewing with, right? He has a bland personality, you know, just cold, like, no personality, whatever. And then he gets the question right, but he just rubs people wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Like, who, who do you think the company's going to hire? Like, the, one at 10 a.m. or 1 p.m., right? And just something... And just because those people had a, something that happened to them to, to interviews, the, their thought process changes, right? It's so subjective, right. I think, and people don't realize that, right? And even again, and you, and you get an interview panel, right? People don't realize how hard it is to get people, four people in an interview panel at the same time, right? <laughs> because they have full-time jobs, you know? Yep. And I think a lot of candidates don't get that. I, I, I think there is, a again, it's, it's easy, and you and I see it all over um, social media, right? It's their fault, their fault. It's the recruiters, it's the hiring managers. Honestly, I really think it comes down to common sense and common courtesy and people being self-aware, other aware, and value aware. And I don't think we do that sometimes because I just got into a car accident right now. The only thing I'm thinking about is my insurance. Mm-hmm. Hmm, maybe if I ask the question, hey, are you okay? Something's going on with you right now. You seem like you're a little tense. Well, I just got into a car accident. Oh, would, would you feel comfortable rescheduling us? I'll keep your slot. I'll do all of that. People yeah. don't stop to listen and be present, Jason. <laughs> That's a good point. Here's a good example for you. So one of my post-army jobs, I was an HR director at a local college. So I was in charge of recruiting for all the professors, all the people at the college, right? And we were hiring for, for like a senior, pro, for like, I can't remember the term, but like a base, a, a senior professor, one of the, one of the um, academic things, right? And so one that people get interview was like an internal academic professor, right? And during the process, one of the part of the process was whoever was getting interviewed, an hour before the actual interview, they will come and one of the people on the panel will come give them a tour of the college. Show them around the college, introduce them or whatever. And so this person said, well, well, I'm not doing that, right? I don't know. I already know whatever's on the college, right? I'm not doing that. Well, it's a part of the process, Rob. Well, I've been here for three, three, four years. I know what's going on. I don't know what things at. This waste my time. I'll be here for the interview. I said, okay. And for the panel, you never know who's going to show up for the, to do the process, do the process <laughs> right? The person that day, was a dean of the school. So basically this guy blew off the dean of the school and obviously he did not get the job. Right. You know, just, yeah. 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 It, and again, it's just being a little sensitive and aware. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's, I liked your question earlier, Jason, of there's a difference between empathy and sympathy, right? Yes. Sympathy yes. will take you down a rabbit trail. Okay. And, and empathy is being other aware and going, hmm, I've been in those situations too. You know, um, one of the things that gets thrown at recruiters all the time is we don't follow up and don't uh, respond quickly and don't communicate to folks. And I'm like, what I'd really like to say to them is I've gotten over 170 emails today, had 30 people IMing me on LinkedIn while I'm trying to write my article. And I'm sorry, I'm going to forget somebody. But yeah. you're going to lambast me because I didn't get to you. No. <laughs> yeah. How many, how many candidates think that you're their personal recruiter and you're not working with anyone else? Right now, we have um, close to 4,000 candidates that we're working with. Okay. But, but how, many, like, how, how many of them think that you're, you're the only one? That you, that you, you, how many candidates think, okay, Derek is only working with me, Jason Cabinets. Like they're not working with anyone else, right? So that's a great question. We make them feel like that w- they are the only people we're working with. Mm. Nice. Um, what do you want to see changed in the recruiting, in the recruiting industry? Self-aware, other-aware, and world values-aware. I think um, there was a post, Jason. There was a, I had a meme about a month ago. There was one um, CEO that was saying, hey, have you ever gone through your own hiring process? And the other one went, hey, if you don't meet all the must-haves and requirements, just go ahead and submit your resume. And I'm thinking to myself, both of those folks, one showing other aware going, hey, I've been so distant from this. Maybe I should go through this process and see what it's like. The other one was like, hey, just submit everybody. And I'm thinking to myself, come on, dude. Is that really how you hired people? They only had 20% of the skills and you went because their mommy told them that they could do it. You hired them? No, there was a process that you went through with all of that. People need to be a little bit more self-aware, other aware and world and values aware. I think that's what's going to change the industry, buddy. Yeah, I think I'm probably that too. And I think stats so for food this, like, poses requirements on the, on the job, right? A female will only apply if they meet 100%, right? If mm. they're 99, they don't apply. 
a guy, yeah. I, I'm ha- I'm 50% I apply for a right. So Is that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I had that title once. I'll go ahead and spray and pray. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that's something that needs to be fixed also. But again, the reason why they're doing that is because they know it's a numbers game and no one's told them and no one's working with them and guiding them through. There's some of it's fear-based. I mean, again, I get all this. We only have a little piece of data from our perspective, Jason, as a recruiter of what I'm dealing with from my perspective. I haven't been rejected. I was talking with a candidate this morning to become a dear friend. He's rejected over um, 10 plus times yesterday. And you know, um, I can't imagine what that feels like. Now, don't get me wrong, you and I as entrepreneurs and having our own business, it is a bipolar thing, right? For us, it's like, cool, I'm having the greatest day of my life by three o'clock, vendor called in, you lost money doing such and such, and now the world sucks type of thing. But that's that's us. I can't imagine looking to other people to define what your identity is and then being told that you don't meet that identity all day long. I'm surprised we don't have more, um, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Uh, shootouts and doing some of those types of things, right? I know. What, what's your advice on Candace as far as being active on social media? Like, should they be posting on LinkedIn once a day? Should they be like doing a blog? Should they be like posting something on Instagram, talking about the job search? Or what's your advice yeah. on those kind of things? So we actually have a samurai scroll for this and I've explained a, a few things. Um, I don't have do this and you'll get this formula. Uh, I don't subscribe to some of that type of thinking because you don't know the situation. You can't control the variables of reach who's watching and doing all that type of stuff with the analytics and algorithms running in the background. So at a minimum, I would say this, Jason, one, um, take advantage of the open to work designation type of thing, depending on your situation. Um, some, some candidates can't be put in open to work while they're working at a place because their boss is going to find out. Right. And I get that. Um, but you can make that designation only available to recruiters. Another thing, I one of the things that attracts me to a candidate, for instance, is me watching them invest back in the network that they're interested in. So, for instance, um, I met an awesome guy by the name of Jonathan Lee um, that we are partnered with. Um, Jonathan Lee is a global educator. Um, he has his own day job doing some, some things. And I'm answering your question. One of the things I love about him is that he has a day job. He gets paid for nothing. I'm about to tell you what he's doing, but he has almost 12K followers. And all he does is advocate for job seekers all day long. His comments, his intentionality of posting, the things that he does, um, how he encourages people, the things that he flags and sees, that's going to set you apart as a candidate. When it comes to me personally or working with a candidate, and I had one that has been um, contributing and being a trust agent to his circles, celebrating his or her friends who've got a job and that type of stuff to the one that's IMing me six times going, here's my resume, bro, help me find a job. Who do you think I'm going to work with? The one who's given back. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so the days of working for the same company for 20, 25 years are long gone. But when, uh, is it, uh, but when is it too soon for someone to leave a job? Like suppose you get hired, and within 60 days, like, man, my boss is horrible. This company is horrible. I need to leave. Is that too soon to leave? Or should someone like stay the company up for a year? Or like, is there a recommendation on that? Yeah, I, I think that's subjective, Jason. It comes down to, again, that essentialism for everyone. At the end of the day, I'm talking with a candidate right now. I've been going back and forth with them um, today, as a matter of fact. They just got a position, been looking for a long time. They're in their first week and getting ready to write the resignation letter. And that's the right thing for them to do because it affects their conscience and their situation. And then at the end of the day, no one's going to care about your life more than you is what I would say to, say to that. So if you need to resign and leave because it's a toxic environment or whatever, then leave. <laughs> and, and do it well. Yeah. Right? And, and of course, the caveat is, you know, all those advice me and Derek are given. You know, everyone's economic situation is different, right? So you got to do what right. supports you. In, in terms of like, if you can't afford to lose your job or can't afford to, you know, if you have to take a bad, quote unquote bad job, you need a mortgage or pay for something, you, know, you got to do what you got to do, right? But always set yourself yeah. for the best situation you can, I think. That's a good point, Jason. And so let me, let me, if I could extrapolate on that. There is a, there is some entitlement out there I deserve and I should have. That's not what I'm advocating. I'm advocating somebody who's got core convictions on some things. For instance, uh, let's throw out a controversial one. I'm not one of these, by the way. Um, some folks are taking religious preference for the COVID vaccination. 
Okay. Um, we have some direct clients. It's mandatory that you're vaccinated. And I have to tell those candidates, because of your decision, you realize you just cut your job search in half with the Fortune 500 and Fortune 15 companies, because this is what they're doing. Yes, but you don't understand. It's against our rights. I thought you were a Christian. And I'm like, look, I worked at Burger King and said, hi, welcome to Burger King. So I could get my first computer. Sometimes you get to suck it up and do it. Yeah. <laughs> you follow me? Yeah, I definitely do. Um, you already talked about the sum. Can you go in more detail about the importance of networking? Say again. Can you talk? You already talked about the sum, but can you talk more about the importance of networking? Oh, I think it's critical. And um, again, back from our bunker lab days when we uh, had all those books that we had to read, buddy. Um, I, I highly recommend Trust Agent, in which it talks about there's 19 methods of gaining traction in your business, and one of the sales funnels is networking. What does that look like? It's different. We're in a different era. It used to be when I had outsourced CIO that I would go to technology events, places where I was the subject matter expert, and that's where my clients were. We're in COVID now. Six feet. Can't go to a conference anymore. Now I got to do all this stuff virtually. How do you network there? To me, networking there is um, being humble with the networking. Same principles apply. Same thing you would do in person. Um, I meet people all the time on LinkedIn and, and the media venues that we're in by just going, man, that was an awesome comment. One of my favorite ones right now, going back to the essentialism right now is, man, I love connecting with other essentialists. And you wouldn't believe how many people are like, me too, and bang, and we start a conversation. Find something that you like together. It's not just about get, getting business cards. Yes, there is some intentionality. I like what Keith Ferrazzi said, be a connector. Connect people around you with people who need to be connected to other people around. <laughs> yeah, I, I know one thing I'll tell people, especially veterans. Like when I, when I got out, I used to go to job fairs. Everyone was a veteran, right? Or it'd be like, you know, first command financial companies were, or, you know, government jobs. Yeah. But now I see veterans now, it's like, go, go to a place where you're the only veteran, right? Like go to Chamber of Commerce, go to Chase Toastmasters. Yes. Yep. Go to a Rotary Club, go to somewhere where you're the only, you're the only veteran. Because once the people yep. know you're a veteran, they're going to come talk to you, right? Yep. And another thing too, I think a lot of veterans get wrong. And you know, like, because most military base, like, you no, know, Fort Lewis is like 45 minutes from Seattle. No one goes to Seattle, even though that's where the job's at. Fort Hood's <laughs> like 45 minutes from Austin. Right. I think Fayetteville is like 45 minutes from the biggest city, right? And so I don't think they take the time needed for network until the very last minute. I think, you know, of course, I mean, you can't blame, right? You know, they're doing PT at 5 in the morning, get up for six. Right. Are you really going to tell, are you, are you really tell your spouse, hey, I know I've been gone all day. I'm going to drive <laughs> yeah, an hour right. to Austin <laughs> and get back at midnight so I can you know, network, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, yeah. you better get your ass back here and put the, put the kids <laughs> in bed. Sleeping on the couch. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah, challenge, no, I think, you know. It's a it's a different world of networking. And I, I and again, I I think if you wanted a tool or a resource, and you you I know you'll agree with me, uh, read Never Eat Alone by Geith Ferrazzi. It's a good place to start. New York Times bestseller. He talks about redeeming the time that you have and the connections you already have around you. He also lists the depth, best types of people to connect with. And when I first did that book and read that book, I was doing outsourced CIO. And one of those people is recruiters. And lo and behold, guess what? I'm part of that connector circle now. And um, it's amazing. Yeah, find your tribe. Derek, can you talk some more about your entrepreneurial journey? Um, I wish I could share a picture and maybe I should have gotten if I knew that you were going to um, ask that question. My CPA I've been with for 25 plus years and he has a folder with every business card that I've had for every business on the inside jacket. And I was sharing it with my fiance um, last uh, two years ago when a C outsource CIO was acquired. Um, he actually called everybody in the office and he said, I've been with this guy for 30 years and I've watched his trip and he's done it. He's finally made it. And it's been a blessing to walk with this guy through that process. So I like to tell people my early entrepreneur walk was um, starting businesses by the seat of your pants. Um, I would get frustrated with things in society and like, here's a better way. All that energy you noticed earlier you were talking about. And I'd be like, I know I could do this. And I recruited a couple other people who were like, yeah, that is a better way to do that and start a business out of that. Um, 
as I got older, I realized that there's some wise people around me and probably have some um, speed bumps and scars and bandages that I don't have and could help me navigate through those things. And I looked into an accelerator and um, I know some people have pros and cons about all that, but I am thankful that I went through Bunker Labs. It literally changed my life to be around my military tribe, to go through that event, to have people mentor and coach me, to do those types of things. You cannot build a business alone. It is scary. It's almost like a job search. Every single day, I wonder what's going on. Hey, you think it's hard finding a job. How would you like to pay for an employee's salary and have to be worrying about that every single week, that their family is relying on you? That's yeah, you know what? <laughs> you that's, that's, what? That, that's a great point. Like, I don't think a lot of people, when they hire people, oh, I'm hiring Jason Cabinets. They, they don't make a connection. You're not only hiring me, you're hiring me and my family because this my family depends on the paycheck you're about to give me, right? And people don't get That's that, right. I don't think. Yeah. So talk about how you take care of yourself and how you take care of your wellness. Mm. It's been, that's been a, a large struggle. So I actually, I'm a routine guy. Um, so in the morning, um, I get up in the morning. I have uh, what I call quiet time or clarity break time. I actually have a prayer app that I use and pray for folks. I also have a Bible reading plan and I read through my Bible. And then I do a um, 15 to 20, 30 minute uh, full body workout during the week, five times a week. If I don't do those things, Jason, I feel like something's missing in my day. And because I have tried the whole, hey, I'll work out after work. Mm, no, that's not going to happen for me. <laughs> And so um, usually by the end of work, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do that tomorrow. So I taught and disciplined myself to do that stuff in the morning. And it sets the tone for my day. Don't get me wrong. It's not every day. But my goal is five days a week. Bjarne asked me about it. Have you worked out five times a week for 30 minutes or more since the last time we met? Have you slept seven hours or more a day, five times a week? Um, I just started taking naps for the first time in my life and didn't start feeling guilty about that, um, Jason, because I was like, oh, there's always something more to do. No, I'm tired. I'm flipping tired running a company and posting and helping candidates and loving my fiance. And I just want to take a nap. <laughs> and it's yeah. okay to do that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I just saw going to the gym like last week. I hadn't been in the gym forever, right? And just, a, just, a, just the, what you get from going to the gym, just, it's, it's just outstanding, right? There's no, it's like, man, what, right. what, why, why did I stop for, right? It just, That's I don't right. know. <laughs> so just for me, you um, so much. well, and because I had injuries, um, the VA um, called me in uh, two years ago and said, hey, there's a surgery, 85%, you get quality of life back. And um, if you take this and... You know, I had resolved that I would never be able to do martial arts again, that I would never be able to do workouts again, that I would never be able to fully walk, possibly with a cane and some other things. And I got surgery. I'm up to 10,000 steps um, pretty consistently. I do full body workouts, watching my food. I eat whatever I want, enjoy adult beverages. I sleep. Um, you ask what my routine is. I'm trying to protect my assets. The only area I'm working on right now that I have a hard time with is what's called permission to play. And permission to play is doing something fun. Um, I like to do things with other people. And after the last couple of years of things that happened through divorce and some of that other type of stuff, I've kind of kept people at a distance. And I like to do things with other people. So um, Bjarne is holding me accountable that I need to go shooting. And so um, that was one of the things I've done for recreational. I've got a HK VP9. And I like to go range shooting and I uh, like to take folks with me who's never done that before. But that's what I'm working on, Jason. That's something I don't do in my life. I work out, I read, I do all that other stuff, but I don't give myself permission to play. So, Dick, talk about this. I think so many new entrepreneurs, they have an idea, whatever, and their mindset, you know, they believe the hype and the myth, right? You know, oh, Mark Zuckerberg made a million dollars in six months <laughs> or, you know, you know, Apple made it in six months, right? You know, people don't realize that the time and patience it takes to be successful, you know, whatever your term of success for means, right? Right. What's your advice to these people like, you know, think they're going to start a company and, you know, within a year are going to be, you know, the next billionaire? They, they may. Good luck. <laughs> um, you and I both know that to actually create a movement takes a lot more than that. Right. PayPal wasn't fully embraced until years later. 
<laughs> and still, they still had a problem. Amazon, again, they had the first online ordering and doing all that, but it was clunky when it first came out, <laughs> right? It took a while to build that engine. It takes a while to do some of those things. And I think it's being okay. I call it wholly discontent, discontent Jason. You got to be okay with not having that or delayed gratification, right? You got to be disappointed in the things that are the way they are, which spurs you on to do the things that you need to do. But sometimes it's working a dead end job. Uh, when I was working 60 to 80 hours a week and my entrepreneurial bug kicked in, I was like, I can't do this. I'm not going to do that. But I sucked it up for a while to persevere through so that I could have the money to do that. <laughs> it, it takes work to complement what you're saying. Yeah. Like I said, you, you got to do what you got to do, right? Sometimes yeah. maybe, you, maybe you got to take a part-time gig at Burger King or you do, or maybe you, maybe you need to sell some plasma, you know, on the side. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know? Better done that. <laughs> yep. Yep. You got you to do those kind of things. Yeah. Um, so you already did this a little bit. Can you talk in more detail about how your current company got started? What you're focused on right now and what your vision is for Samurai in the future? Yeah. So um, we do subscribe to uh, EOS, as I mentioned, and um, we have our business plan done. It's called a VTO or it stands for a vision traction organizer. Uh, we have core values and core focus. It was started because um, I did not like recruiters and I knew that there had to be another way. When I read Keith Ferrazzi's book on being a connector, I thought just referring people to recruiters was helping them. Uh, what I found out was it wasn't. And then I started hearing what was happening and I was like, somebody hasn't worked this out. Somebody hasn't made this better. Why, why is it this way? And so I'll never forget, I was going to a networking meeting and a friend of mine said, hey, Derek, you ever thought that all those people you refer to me and these other recruiters that you could be making money doing that? I was like, look, I don't have time for that. I hate recruiters. I don't want to get involved in that. That guy was persistent. The third meeting I went to, he's like, hey, Derek, you got a second? And he showed me this check and it was for double digits. And I was like, what's that? And he goes, oh, that's for the placement for 20% um, of a yearly salary of blank. And I went, are you serious? And he said, yep. And I said, you can make that by placing a candidate? And he goes, yes. So my first thought was, wow, there's got to be something more to this because you don't get rich quick doing that. And so um, I decided to look into it. And ironically, one of the clients that I had for outsourced CIO was a company <laughs> that you were making fun of earlier of, hey, I found a new recruiting method. And they came up with this new tool that was going to be a crowdsourcing tool and doing some things. And they asked me to do a business case of all the applicant tracking systems that were out there and the recruiting tools that were out there. And I did an exhaustive search. They were paying me to do it. And um, I started seeing the intricacies of the industry. And I was like, yeah, this can be streamlined. And um, Samurai Hire started in April of 2021. Uh, after my company was acquired and I came up with a logo, had the website up. My fiance was like, you literally had that web page up on one day doing such and such. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm not a creative and I wanted to be done with it. And I wanted to focus on the relationship aspect. So how does it, how does it, how did it get from where it was to where it is today to where we're headed? I have learned that the glade gratification, you don't come out with a big, hairy, audacious goal and start telling a bunch of people about that stuff because they'll freak out. And some of the assets that you need to help you build that kind of business also go, whoa, you're, that's intimidating. You don't even know what you're doing. You haven't been in the industry for a while. So I wanted to, I took 2021 to figure out the recruiting industry, the candidate side of things and the HR side of things. And it did some study. And then I saw some things that need to be changed in there. And then I asked myself the question, Jason, are you ready to make that an essential? Is this who you are? And this is, is this what your identity is? Is this your calling? Is this what God's called you to do? And I said, yep, this is what I'm called to do. This is bigger than any church congregation that I've ever been involved in or on staff with. There is a, always new people in your life. There's always opportunities to learn something new. There's uh, always going to be work. Our economy doesn't function without it, right? It's kind of like healthcare. And to me, it's not going, any, going away. Somebody's going to have to pick up a hammer somewhere or do something in some form of fashion, whether it's information workers or something. Our vision for the future is to standardize the industry for recruiting, for candidates, and for HR. 
We want to make it effortless for people to navigate the process to find a job, not only in the civilian sector, we're also going to be starting to hit the veteran side of things. Our next goal um, for the remainder of this quarter is to start working on what's called the DOD Skill Bridge Program. If you're not familiar with what that is, it helps people who are transitioning out of the military to actually get work and work in a profession while they're getting their active duty pay and to transition into a field that they think or believe is going to help them gain a career and do some of those types of things. And um, Jason, you probably know this just like I do. There's a lot of waste and um, junk going on in that as well. And people being taken advantage of. I'm working with five or six candidates right now who are in a skill bridge program because somebody did their credentialing, but they have no job and they're freaking out. They bought houses, they've planted their families and they were told that this is what was going to happen for them. And I just don't think that's right. And my heart beats for people like that. I was a foster kid. And most of the great things that happened in my life was because of other people helping me. And I want to help a few other people, as many as I can, before I say goodbye to my 22 summers, Christmases, all that other stuff. If that makes sense. Derek, is a job here different if you're a white-collar person or a blue-collar person? I understand and appreciate that there is a lot of that out there. I work with all that DEI stuff that's going on, diversity, inclusion, all of those things that are going on. Yes, there is prejudice. Here's where I would go with that. I see a lot of ageism too, okay? And so it isn't just about color. It isn't just about background. It's about age, no matter where you're at with some of those things. I think you come up with a Ronin list and put people on that who do those types of things, we'll see some things change as well. Again, salary shouldn't be different for women than it is for men. Yeah, but you're trying to change years of doing such and such. Hmm. If it's going to impact you of 30,000 followers and people boycott your company, guess what? You're going to change. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so Derek, so is there a difference between like a, how a job search goes, like we'll say for an accountant or lawyer or a tech person? Versus how a job search goes for like a, like a plumber or construction worker. You mean salaries or you mean process? Just, just, a, mean? just a process, yeah. Um, I have found that actually blue collar or those, uh, you know, work with your hands types of folks, their interview process is actually a lot streamlined and simpler than most of ours. My fiance works in property management. She needs housekeepers and things like that. It's literally two interviews. Got your resume, looked at it, talked to you on the phone. Can you be here on Tuesday? Hmm, you're a tech guy who can code. Oh, let's have six discussions with you. I want you to meet my buddy over here. We're overcomplicating things. <laughs> okay. Uh, I agree. So how many people are, are work for you at your company? So I'm on my second employee. Um, Catherine Ponitaski is a virtual assistant of mine. She's uh, currently in part-time. We're trying to work on getting her up to full-time on some things. Um, I want to bring on by the end of this year, uh, two more recruiters who are specialized in areas that I'm not, and that Catherine is not, and probably a couple more assistants just to handle the communication aspect of things that's important. So Derek, walk us through your hiring process. Say again? Walk, walk us through your hiring process. What goes through my hiring process? Yeah. Um, full transparent job description, telling salary and all of that. We also use a pre-hire assessment tool that um, gauges behavioral and cognitive assessments to make sure that folks are a good fit for the culture. And once that's done, after a conversation, does this look good? Um, the assessments do a lot of the hard, heavy lifting for us type of thing because we don't want to uh, put somebody in a position where they're going to fail. For instance, Catherine is my rock star uh, that I should have found the first time and had the high standards for. I wanted her to be a perfect match is what I wanted with my assessments and my tool, and she was. And so um, it's okay to have some of those standards, but mine streamlined, just like I'm talking about. Why would I make that difficult for somebody? I want Catherine to know where she stands on a regular basis. I want, to know, I want her to know where, where she's going. 
We have quarterly conversations. We don't do yearly performance evaluations. So, so every 90 days, she has an opportunity to talk with me about where her position is. Can she meet her goals and her rocks and scorecard items? I am a 100% transparency type of person. That's our hiring process. Nick, are there any recruiters out there that you follow? Yes, uh, quite a few, actually. Um, probably the first one that comes to mind is Joe Lagley. Um, and it's because he made me laugh. Um, he um, constantly posts these memes about the recruiting life type of scenarios and he'll use giphys and some other things like that but i also follow him because he also has great content um great articles i also follow career coaches hr folks i've got it yeah i follow a lot of those stuff derek understand you have something for the understand you have something for the listeners today say again i understand you have something for the listeners today have something for the listeners. Okay, yeah, gotcha, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, as part of, um, if you were listening to the podcast, if you were a company and like to engage Samurai Hire to help you find your next talent and have a streamlined process where we could work through finding you the perfect candidate, um, we'd love to give you a 25% discount on your first month subscription, which is $2,000 per job description. So if you had five job descriptions, it's an additional $500 for each of those. We'd give you 25% discount off of your first month to get started with us just to test this out. Oh, by the way, you can also cancel after that as well. So get your discount and cancel in the same month with us to do some of those things. But the offer to the listeners is, hey, give us a shot. Let's see what transparency looks like. One of our direct clients right now, Jason, embrace the transparency that I'm talking with you about. And it's probably one of the best experiences that I've ever seen in the recruiting realm of just salaries out there, companies out there, process out there, interviews happening in a timely fashion, people being communicated with. It's amazing. Okay. And Derek, do you have a, a ask for the listeners? I do. So we are putting out, uh, we actually created three tags out on LinkedIn space and I've actually worked through them and they're associated with us. One of them is called Recruiter Tribe. That's my family um, community. You can follow Recruiter Tribe, hashtag Recruiter Tribe. Another one is um, Job Seeker Advocate, hashtag Job Seeker Advocate. The third one is Hiring Manager Trust Agent. It embodies the principles that Jason and I have been talking about today. Let's all remember that we're self-aware that we all have essentials in our life, that somebody else might have an essential as well. And let's remember that other people have other things going on in their life as well. And it isn't always just about us. And then finally, um, that hiring, uh, hiring manager trust agent aspect of it, that hashtag also, follow those with us. You will constantly see content related to this. If you see hashtag Ronan list, you will know that some topic on abusing people in some form or fashion or making a, a process arduous and tumultuous and cumbersome is, is what that means. Anytime you see the hashtag Ronin list. And so if you like negative stuff, uh, we will call it out with hashtag Ronin list, <laughs> but we'll also be redemptive and share with folks. So that's the ask. If you're interested, follow those hashtags, join us with this movement. It's gonna take an army to change the industry. Um, I don't believe that, oh, that'll never change. And it's always been that way. We live in a crowdsource world now. People can change things. And Derek, can you share your social media for both yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Social media, yes. Um, most of our uh, backlash tags are Samurai Hire. So Twitter, at Samurai Hire. Facebook, Samurai Hire. Um, we, our Facebook, I'm sorry, our website page is SamuraiHire.com. And that's the theme that we have for everything. So Samurai Hire should pull us up, whether you're on LinkedIn, whether you're on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, we're in all those places. And to listen, if we have the links to, to everything, to, to include the social media in the show notes, you find the show notes at www.cabinetshrblog.com. Be sure to set, share this episode with your networks and remember to subscribe or any of you the Jason Cabinet's experience. So there are a couple more questions I came up with. Um, how much of your time do you spend, quote unquote, like training hiring managers to make sure they're doing the right thing, make sure they, they're doing the right thing, you know? Yeah, How much yeah. of your time do you have to spend hiring, like training hiring managers, so to speak? Yeah, 
So um, actually got a partner on that now um, to help us out with on that. But I would say right now between the actual people who are HR folks that are sending me messages and asking for help to our direct clients that we're training on how to do business with us, I would say five to seven hours a week right now. And what is that? Like, how do you train them? How do you get them up to speed? You just got to show them like, is it basically, hey, you can't do this. You need to do this. No, no, no. <laughs> Nobody learns that way, right? I call that management by fly swap. Um, it comes back to a core philosophy of ours. And again, um, most companies, Jason, core values and core focus is an inward document, not in an EOS world. EOS, core values and core focus is not only internal, it is external. And it relates to what you're talking about. I listen to hiring managers and ask good questions because you don't know why people are doing things until you listen. Hey, we've always done it this way. Why? Well, this is the old beat up computer that I have, the only thing that we have, and it can only process 16 bit forms on it. Oh, now I know you coming in there and saying, hey, you're an idiot. Why are you doing that? Is not helpful at all. Listen, ask good questions. And when you're humble like that, people want to know, hey, is there a better way to do this? So Jason, let me say this. Yeah. I don't have all the answers, buddy. I know there's some problems. I know that people are getting hurt in this process. I know that to me, at the end of the day, listening, asking good questions, and then listening and asking more good questions, that's how you train people. So Derek, you talked earlier about how you vet your companies, but how, how will you handle this? You know, like in the future, you vet a company. But for a reason, it's not working out right. The company is doing things wrong. They're not listening to you. What the case would be, what's your process for the quote unquote, you know, separating from that company? Yeah. So um, I call it the roadhouse philosophy. Be nice until it's time not to be nice and then be nice. And I believe also that everybody, um, when given an opportunity, will do the right thing. And people have done that for me. And so um, we actually did fire a split fee company that we were working with. It was a recruiting company that we were with. I didn't call them out. They knew our core values and focus. They took a candidate and didn't respond to him in a timely fashion and dragged him along with some things. And I said, this is what we're talking about. Can you please follow up with so-and-so? And I waited. So there's a difference between delegating things and not doing anything about them. There's a difference in EOS of delegating and elevating, which means that you do check up on some of that stuff. And when they did it again, I said, I'm sorry, this is not a good fit for us. We've got some other objectives and other ways that we're headed in the future. Um, I'd like to refer you to some other folks that possibly might be good fits for you. But at this time, you're not a good fit for us. I'm a firm believer, Jason, of hiring, I'm sorry, firing your problematic clients, whether they're candidates, recruiters, hiring managers in this industry, 10%, the bottom 10%, because they'll suck up your time. Dick. Can you, can you more clearly define what it means to respond in a timely manner? Like, is it within two days, three days, and a minute? Like, what, what, what does respond in a timely manner mean to you? Respond in what kind of what? And, and a, what does it mean to respond in a timely manner? Is it like two days, three days, right away? What does that mean? Yeah, again, you got to have relational equity to understand what that means. Um, if it's a serious nature type of thing with folks, I'm like, you don't leave somebody hanging for a week. I mean, let's be honest. We got business hours, people are working, doing some of the things in our samurai scroll. Number one, I mentioned, hey, if you're going to circle back with a recruiter, don't ping them tomorrow after you just applied for the job. Wait a few days. <laughs> you're laughing. They do it all the time to us. Okay. <laughs> and there's like, hey, did you hear anything yet? And I'm like, and, and, and um, not, only the, they, not only the email, they send a LinkedIn message, send you a Twitter DM. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And um, I usually say, please wait about a week because here's the deal, at least from a recruiter perspective, Jason, I want you to get placed as much as everybody else because they get paid when you do. And so believe me, I'm going to tell you if I find out something. <laughs> you follow? So Derek, is there anything I should have asked you that it didn't or anything else you want to talk about? Actually, there is. Jason, I want to thank you. Um, I meant what I said earlier about our relationship. I, um, I don't know if it's an age thing or just getting beaten up by the world and I'm in a different place. I am very grateful for you, man. Thank and you. I'm, and I'm thankful for, not that you have me on a podcast, but we've been in each other's lives for what, since 2018 now? I think so, yeah. Yeah. And uh, we've always, always shot straight with each other. We've always been honest with each other. We've been a lifeline relationship, authentic, accountable, generous, and vulnerable. I love you, brother. And I'm Thanks thankful. You. Love you too. Thank you. Um, Derek, 
Can you give us any last minute advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Yeah, there's a lot of brokenness in, this, in the world today. We were talking about recruiting, hiring managers, and the job seeker environment. It isn't just impacting those industries. It's everywhere. It's logistics. It's in the military. It's everywhere. And I think I would hope that people would understand that there is always a lot more going on than we're aware of in people's lives. That what we assume is the presenting information, why somebody's doing something the way they are, you really don't know. <laughs> you don't know. You didn't wear their shoes. You didn't go somewhere. And maybe I'm hypersensitive to that, Jason, because people have always questioned my motives because I'm a bold guy with a foot-shaped mouth and tend to have, be out in the front and all that type of stuff. And they can't wait to prove me wrong. But I've also seen people hurt by it. Yesterday, I met with a candidate who has a disability and he was probably the most empathic EQ superhero guy I've ever met in a long time. And he blew me away. And if I would share one thing, it is you don't have all the data. Always listen, ask good questions, and be a little bit more other aware. And I imagine some things would change in a lot of our lives. That's my message, Jason. <laughs> Derek, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. I love you, brother. I am thankful for you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.